Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, I'm very excited to have you for this lecture. Uh, so this lecture is going to be uh, about the introduction to CNN at very high level. So you will see more pictures and uh, more high level stuff rather than equations. So I try to simplify this stuff for you uh, as a basic introduction for CNN. Sure. So, when we talk about the classification pipeline, we want to classify the images for different object categories. So the first idea is to, to basically figure out the key features for the images. For example, consider the image of the face. So what are the key features? The key features for the face is nose, eyes, and mouse. So the idea is using the machine learning to detect and identify these features, and we use our classification pipeline to classify the images to different object categories. But if you consider the, we want to design the classification pipeline, so the first step is we can basically aggregate our knowledge. Say, for example, this is the data set of the faces. And then the next step is gonna be extracting some features using basically by hand, we basically design the features by hand, which is called hand design features, and we use these features for classifications. So this is gonna be the, the workflow of the traditional machine learning approach. We do feature extraction, some sort of hand design feature, feature extractors, and then we use the classification pipeline to classify object, uh, classify image to different object categories. But what's the problem with this approach? So, if you look at the high level workflow, there will be many variations in the data, in your images, like occlusion, like size variations. So all of these hand design features, basically there are some sort of the challenges, problems in detecting the, those features. So how we can do better, how we can have a robust basically pipeline for the classifications. So the hypothesis is that using neural network, any sort of neural network, either convolutional neural network or fully connected neural network, we can basically learn the hierarchy of the features directly from data without using any hand design features. So we, we want to get rid of those hand design features. So we want to have an end-to-end -end learning pipeline to learn features directly from the data. And this is the idea of using neural networks. So for example, we want to classify the images of the faces. So you can think of extracting some low level features like ages as you see in the left side or to think about detecting some mid level features like eyes, nose, and at the end you have some high level features like an entire phrase, right? So that's the idea of neural networks. But how we can do it? So this is just a reminder because in lab three, you already basically supposed to design a neural, fully connected neural network with two hidden layers. So in fully connected neural networks, each neuron in each layer is fully connected to all neurons in the next layer. But the question is, do we really need all of these connections for the classifications? The answer is no. So, if you look at the details of fully connected neural networks, one of the problems with neural network, except the number of the parameters, is that if you remember how you fit the images to fully connected neural networks, so what you did. So it's, uh, you basically vectorize the 2D images to fit to the fully connected neural networks. You, when you vectorize the image, you basically lose the special information you basically lose the shape information of the images, which is not good, which is not what we want. So one of the problem with fully connected neural network is that the input is just a vector, and we don't want to do that. We want to preserve the special information of the image. So another problem is that if you increase the image size, you will have many parameters. It's gonna be explosion, because, because every single neuron is fully connected to all other neurons. 
to the next layer. So how we can find a better solution? So just, I just want to introduce some motivation before talking about the CNN. So if you notice, for example, in this picture, we want to detect the beak of the bird. We want to have a filter to detect the beak of the bird. So some patterns, like in this picture, are much smaller than the whole image, right? So we have some specific features or patterns that are much smaller than the whole images. And we want to focus on that. And instead of using fully connected neural networks, we want to just pass this part of the image, this local region, to the neurons. So as a result, we have much fewer parameters. That's the idea, right? That's the first motivation. The second motivation is, OK, if you want to detect a specific pattern, no matter where is in this image, is it in the center, top left, top right, is the same pattern, right? So it makes sense if we have like a filter, sort of filters, you can imagine we have just a filter that detect these specific patterns, they can share the parameters. We can compress them, right? We don't need to know basically different weights or parameters for different filters because we want to detect the same pattern. So if the pattern is matter in one part of the image, it should matter in other part of the image. So this is the second motivation. But if we want to translate to the neural network, to the fully connected neural network, how does it work? What we should change to make it work? So if you look at the top, I mean, this figure, the first motivation, as I said in this slide, is called local connectivity, meaning we just want to focus and connect our neuron to one local region of the input image. So this is called local connectivity, meaning instead of having fully connected neural network, we can only focus on a specific part of the input images and connect it to the neurons in the next layer. So that's the first modification we need to do on fully connected neural network to get something better, right? The second one, as I said here, sharing the weights. Means if you want to detect a pattern, so no matter where is in the image, we want to share the weights parameters for different filters that we use. So you see in this picture, we share the weights for two different neurons. So basically, I just show with the same color. So same color means same weights. So we can convert the fully connected neural network to something with the shared parameters between neurons. So the last one is, of course, we have different patterns in the images, and we can have multiple filters, and each filter can basically detect a specific pattern. So we can have multiple filters at the top of each other, stacked together, and each one detect a specific patterns. So it's still, we have much less parameters than fully connected neural networks, okay? So these three are the three main properties of the uh, CNN. So what CNN is by? In 1960, two neuroscientists called Hubel and Wiesel at that time, they are working at Harvard. So they figure out the way that uh, mammals, like a cat, perceive the visual world are very similar. And they are hierarchical, meaning that whenever you see something, whenever you detect something, some of the neurons in your visual cortex will be activated. And you will be able to detect something. So what does it mean, hierarchy? Hierarchy means, so there are many neurons in, in the visual cortex, and they're basically, there's a hierarchy structure, meaning that they cluster together, and each of these cluster detects some specific features or patterns. So uh, starting from V1, so all of these basically V1, V2 has a name in, in neuroscience. I'm not going into details, but I just want to give you the idea how does it work. So all of this V1, V2, you can just imagine as a cluster of the neurons, right? The neuron 
make a clusters, and each of these clusters detect a specific patterns. So uh, starting from the left side, uh, you can see some edges of the face, and then you will see these uh, small pieces grouped together and make some shape structures in the next layer, in the next basic cluster. And then you see here the whole face, the entire face. And at the end, basically, you can say, okay, this is the face of me, and this is the face of John Philippe, for example. So you will get some semantic information at the end. So this is the idea of the hierarchical feature representation. So this is where CNN comes from. So in the 1980, Fukushima introduced CNN, but at that time there was no backdrop theory for training CNN. So Yon Li Kong, the Facebook director of AI, so introduced, not, not introduced, they used backpropagation to train CNN in 1989. So I'm just gonna introduce the convolutional neural network without any brain stuff, without any view of the neurons, just talk about the mathematical operations, and then I'm going to talk about the neuron view and how we can interpret them based on the neurons and connections between the neurons. So this is how basically CNN looks like, the CNN, typical CNN for classifications. So every, almost every CNN, just imagine for classification now, has two different parts. The first part is feature extraction, as you see in the left side here. So all of these layers, basically, you can consider as a feature extraction, feature extractor. And then at the, at the top, you have classification heads, which is pretty much normal neural network, fully connected neural networks, which does classification job. <clears throat> so, whatever we, we talk about the CNN, we mean this part, and mainly convolution layers. So there are three different layers or operation in this part, uh, namely convolution layers, nonlinear activation, and pooling. So I'm going to introduce these three layers in the feature extraction part, and then at the end, I'm gonna introduce fully connected layers, which is very similar to what you have learned and tried before. So first, I start with convolution layer. <coughs> So, the input of CNN, you can just imagine a bunch of images, is always volume, right? So, in this case, we, you have the color images, 32 by 32 by 3. So, this tree, we call it depths. Depths shouldn't be confused with the depths of CNN. So, depths represent the number of channels in your input data. For example, for color images, you have RGB, red, green, blue channels. So you have three depths here. So what it happens, you pass this volume of input images to your CNN, and you also have these tiny uh, small filters. In this case, we just imagine we have one filter, the blue one, and this blue one also have a depth, has a depth, right? So you can have five by five, tiny filters, and the point is the depth of this filter should exactly match with the depth of the input, which is three. It's always like that. Whatever the depth of your input is should be exactly matched to the depth of your filters. And the depth of the filters is extends over all of the depths of your input volume. So what you do, you need to convolve this filter on your input volume. So basically, you slide this kernel over the images like this, and whenever you do a sliding, you do dot product between your filters and your input volume. So the dot product means you basically just imagine you want to learn the weights of this filter, right, W. So dot product means when you do a sliding, you basically multiply element-wise of each value of your filters or parameters of your filters and your input volume. So gonna be W transpose X, sorry, W transpose X plus B. 
X is your input volume. It's a small region of your input volume. In this case, it's five by five by three. So, so at the end, you have five <coughs> times five times three, 75 parameters plus bias. So these are the whole number of the parameters for these specific filters, right? So I just wanna explain again. When you do convolution, you basically slide over your kernel over the input volume, and when, whenever you do a sliding, you basically do dot product between your filter parameters and your input volume. So this is how does it work, right? Any question from this part? Okay, so, and just once you do a sliding, you get one single output value. So that's why you, the output size, the depth of the output size is always one. But especially, you get 28 by 28 times one. Why 28? Because your input is 32 by 32, <coughs> and your filter size is five by five, right? When you do a sliding, there will be 28 unique position that you can slide over, over the width and height of your input volume. So that's why you get 28 by 28 output feature maps. So this one basically gonna be a response of your filter over the input volume, okay? Any question? So again, this you can, you can consider here, you do a sliding by a sliding, there will be 28 unique position here and 28 unique position here. So that's why you get 28 by 28. And this one, basically, the result of this dot product here. So you, you do dot product for all the values and you sum it up to get one single output, okay? So then you can just do it the same process for the next filter, this time the green one. And you get different feature maps, which is computed independently from the first feature maps. And just imagine if you have six different filters, you get six different slices of your feature maps. So you get 28 by 28 times six these times. So this is called convolution layers, mathematical operation, right? So what we do, we get the input volume and we represent with another volume for the next layer, right? So, and this one, 28 by 28 by six, gonna be the input volume for the next layer. And we just repeat this process based on the number of the convolution layer that we have, right? So, in the next slide, you see that, okay, so for the first convolution layer, we have six different filters, so that's why the depth is six, and then this is going to be the input for the next layer where we have 10 filters. And again, we do dot product, we do a sliding window for the kernels for the next layer to get the output volume for the second layers, right? And this time we have 10 filters, therefore we, we have 24 by 24 by 10s. Why 24? Because there are 24 unique position here if we do a sliding window for five by five kernels or filters. So you might notice that the kernel size this time is five by five by six. Why? Because the depth of the, your filter should exactly match with the depth of your input volume. Okay? So what we end up is the feature hierarchy at the end. Just imagine we have pre-trained network, which is trained before, and we want to visualize the features, what we learn from the CNN. <coughs> and if you see from the very early beginning, so in the left side here, you have low-level features, which is basically visualization of your filters here. So they tune themselves. So first of all, they just initialized randomly, and then they tune themselves to detect the edges, colors. Like see, you can see here, okay? And as we go deeper into the CNN, as we proceed deeper to the layers, we get basically more shape information here, 
you can consider as mid-level features. For example, this neuron got excited to detect the seeker shape, okay? And at the end, you have more semantic features. So you can see the honey shape here, the wheels of the car. So you can basically distinguish different things, right? So in the beginning, you have very low level features, like ages, blobs, colors, and then as you proceed deeper to the CNN, you get more semantic features. And that's the idea of the hierarchy. And this exactly matches with the idea of the, uh, that two neuroscientist that says whenever we detect something, the hierarchy of the features or patterns will be activated. So, one question. So if you notice, by the time and as we proceed deeper, we increase the number of filters. Like here from six, from three to six to 10, why? Anyone knows? The reason is very simple. The, the reason is this picture, actually. Because as we go deeper, we get more semantic features, right, like here. So it makes sense to have more computations in the deeper layers, to more filters, to have more filters, right? And that's, re that's the main reason. So just imagine you want to classify or distinguish between cat and dog, right? These early features are very generic. They don't help us to distinguish between cat and dog. But if you consider these more semantic features here, they can help us to distinguish between cat and dog. So it makes sense to put more weight, to put more computations, to have more filters in the deeper layers. Okay, so uh, let's have a closer look at the convolution. So just imagine we have the filters at the top here, three by three. When I, I'm saying dot product, how does it work? So this filter is like a diagonal edge detection, you see? And you want to apply this filter on the input six by six images. So how does it work? So there's a hyperparameter that's called a strike size. A strike size basically says how much you want to shift your filters, okay? So in this case, is one. So we start from that part. We do dot product, element wise dot product. So just get rid of these zero values and you have one times one plus time, one times one plus one times one, you get three, right? And you just slide your kernel by one. You shift your kernel by one for the next and you just repeat the same process. Element was production, multiplication. And this time you get minus one. And you can just repeat for all of your values of input volume. So you get something like this. And if you notice that the part of the images, the part of the images that exactly has the same pattern, like one, 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 diagonal pattern, you get, you get better response or maximum value in your output. So this is gonna be response of your filter over the images, right? So for these two, because exactly same pattern, you get a high value. Okay, so just imagine another filter. And this time, so we have another filter, going to have another features, and we stack these features at the top of the first feature. So it's going to be like that. You do a sliding window, you compute dot product for every element, and you get the second basic sheet or a slice for your feature maps. So this time, for example, this pattern is exactly the same with your filter. So you get basically higher value here, which is three, okay? Make sense? Question? Yeah. That's a good question. As I said, we in the beginning, in the very beginning, we initialize randomly. And by the time when we train, these weights and parameters will be updated. So I'm going to talk about how we train CNN in, in continue. Okay? So we don't do anything. 
we just learn those parameters, okay? This is what I said. This is the difference with traditional machine learning and CNN. We directly learn from the data end to end. We don't design anything. And that's got feature maps. So we have four by four by two volume of your feature maps. So just consider another example. This time we change the stretch size from one to three here, right? So what do you think? If I move by three, what's going to be next? Your filter doesn't fit to your input volume. So what's the solution? What should we do? Sorry? Yep, that's correct. So if you run it on TensorFlow or any other libraries, depends on the library that you're using, you might get exception or the library by default just discard some part of your <coughs> images to make it fit or adding zero padding. So this is very simple formula you can compute the output size. Just imagine you have n by n input volume, like six by six, seven by seven, whatever, and your filter size is three by three, for example. So you can compute the output size based on this simple formulation. N minus F divided by a stride size plus one. And a stride is the movement or sh how much you shift your ker kernel or filters, okay? So if your input is seven and your filter size is three, you get seven minus three uh, divided by three plus one, you get non-integer value, which doesn't fit to your input volume. So that's why usually we do zero padding. So and pad the input basically volume or image with a zero. Why zero? Because we don't care about what is outside and those values. But you can use other types of the padding as well, based on your applications or task. So <clears throat> in this time, you can easily compute the dot product. So one point about the zero padding, we add zero padding because we don't want the output of convolution layer shrinking too much, right? So this zero padding can help us to control the output size of the convolution layers. Sometimes we want to have the output and input have the same size. So we, want, we, don't, we don't want to shrink in too much because it doesn't work well. Another reason is the boundary effect. For example, this image or this pixel, just, just say pixel here, just overlap by one filters. But this pixel in the centers overlap by many filters. So pixel in the center basically have a strong response in the next layer. We want to avoid that. That's why we use zero padding, okay? So for color images, as I said, the depths of your filter, your two, fi two filters should exactly match with the depths of your input, three. And what you do, you basically apply that product for every channel independently, and you sum it up to get one single output, okay? Make sense? So now I'm going to talk about the nonlinear activation functions. So in between of your convolution layers, you have some nonlinear activation functions. Uh, so the reason is very simple. You can just say the nature of your data is nonlinear. If I give you this uh, red and green points and I ask you to just use one single line to distinguish between these two classes, it's not possible if you have linear basically <coughs> classifier Whatever deep of your network is, you cannot distinguish with a simple line. So use nonlinear activation functions to have basically, or to approximate arbitrary functions using nonlinear activation functions. And this nonlinear activation introduced nonlinearity to your CNN, which is what we need. So there are different type of activation functions, like sigmoid here. We usually use sigmoid for the output of neural network because it maps between zero and one, which is what we want for probability modeling. We have rectifier linear unit here, which is a very common one. We usually use rectifier linear unit, and I'm sure used for lab three, which is piecewise linear functions. And it has very good property I'm going to introduce later. 
And also we have other charts of the activation functions, but these, these are, are the most common ones, okay? Especially rectally in unit. How does it work? It's very simple. You, for negative values, it outputs zero, and for positive values, it just as it is, right? So here, as you see, for positive values, we return the same number, but for negative values, we return zero. You just like a threshold, that's zero, simple. <clears throat> so I just introduced convolution and nonlinear activation function. There is one layer left, which is pulling. I'm going to introduce later. But how we can look at or how we can interpret based on the neurons, how they're connected together. So you can imagine for a specific neuron here or a specific filters and this specific position, when you do that product, the output, we can interpret the output as a neuron, right? At this specific position. So you can see here, you apply that product and adding bias, and then you have nonlinear activation function, which is F here. So you can imagine the output of this filter at this specific position as a neuron. <coughs> As, as I said, the neurons can share the weights. So you, you might have the grid of the neurons to the sheet of the neurons, and this is going, going to be your feature response or feature map of your basically filter over the input volume. Okay, so there are many circles here that make a sheet, to the sheet. Right, 28 by 28. And each of them sharing the weights. Okay? Make sense? So, and you might have multiple filters. So you have volume of these neurons here. They're all looking at the same place for this example. And across the volumes, the weights are not sharing. They have different weights, parameters. But they share the weights over the slice of this volume, okay? So you can consider the volume, and this volume has multiple slices, depends on number of your filters. And over the slice, they share the weights, parameters, but they have different weights over the depths, okay? So the last one is very simple, cooling layer. And what does it do? Pulling layer, basically shrinking of, uh, shrinking your feature map especially. So it doesn't change the depth of your input volume. As you see after pulling the depth, which is 64 here, doesn't change. But it's shrinking your feature volume especially. Like if you use two, two by two pulling layer, you get basically half size from both width and height for your output feature volume. And it applies for each, each slice independently, okay? So do you know why we use pulling? Anyone knows why we use pulling? Why we reduce the size? Because it helps to reduce the computational complexity of your networks. And another reason is when you do pulling, like here, I just want to make another example for pulling. So just imagine we have a windows of two by two, and we basically shift it by two. For every window, we pick the maximum value, which is three here. We don't care about where is the position of this maximum value, right? And this pulling layer basically helps to make your CNN invariant to the shifting, which is very useful for classification. So this is how the pulling works. You, you basically have the windows like two by two. You basically shift your window over your image, and you take single maximum value. We also have the average pulling, but doesn't work well as max pulling. And you just do for all of your windows, like here. So basically, after pulling, you shrink 
your input, and you have a smaller feature maps, especially, not the depths. Depth is fixed, okay? So, shift invariance. So, the, the good thing about CNN is, is invariant to the shifting of your objects. For example, if you want to classify this image for the cat category, right? No matter where the cat is, up, down, right, left, we classify this image as a cat, and CNN is invariant to the shifting. Why? For two reasons. The first reason is for convolution layers. As I said, they share the parameters, and these sharing parameters make the CNN invariant to the shifting translation. And the next reason is max pooling which is not useful as the first one. When you do max pooling, you take the maximum value of the window. You don't care about the position of the maximum value. We just take the maximum value. And it makes your CNN a bit robust to the shifting, okay? So, I talked about this, the first part, the feature extractor, extraction parts, right? So we have the series of the layers you can imagine. We have series of convolution blocks and we have three main operators, or three main operations. Convolution, activation function, and pooling. And you can just stack up these no, uh, layers, whatever, how many you, you like, depends on your task, applications, and you basically ex extract some features which is more robust than those handcrafted features. But at the top, similar to traditional machine learning, we have a classifier, simple classifier. We do feature ex extraction and then we, we need to classify the images based on those features. So this part is very similar to what you have done before, is neural networks, fully connected neural networks, meaning each neuron is fully connected to all neurons in the next layer. So what does it, uh, how does it work? You have these layers to extract the features and these features are going to be flattened or you vectorize the features this time. And you get low dimensional features out of your feature extractors or CNN layers and you pass it to the fully connected layers. Okay, here. And fully connected layers use these features to classify the images. And of course, if you want to classify images, you need to work out with the probability. And we use softmax functions to normalize these output predictions. If we sum it up, we should get one, right? It's just probability. So probability means how likely this image belongs to this specific class or object category, okay? Any question? Okay, so I'm just going to details, just make a very simple example how fully connected layers works. So just imagine we have two classes, cat and dog. We want to classify, we have the binary classifier, in fact. We want to classify the input images to see whether it's this cat or dog. So the first step is training. And just imagine these features in the left are the last features from here. I just I'm not showing this part, okay? So just imagine we do CNN layers, max pooling, activation, and we get some features, and we vectorize these features, okay? So this is going, going to be the, your last features. So you have two by two by three, okay? You have three channels or depths, and you have two by two features. So the first step is vectorize these features. You get two by two by three which is going to be 12. And each of these feature values in fully connected layer, which is basically you have two output here, can vote for the class. It's like a class score. So once you do training, you basically update these weights and each of these lines, you can just imagine as a weight. And the thickness of the lines represent how much a strong your weight it is. So, for example, if you, your input is cat, you get better response for the cat, okay? This is the training. And just imagine for the test image that 
our model doesn't see before, you compute your weights and you basically adding up these numbers for each class to see which one is more stronger, which votes are more stronger. So you get, for example, 92 for the dog and 51 for the cat, and you see, okay, this image classified as a dog, okay? It's like a voting. So the last one is like a voting. <clears throat> so I introduced CNN layers, very basic layers. Of course, we have more layers, but I'm not to, going to cover all of those layers here. Just the basic layers you can see in almost any CNN-based classifications. But the, the, your question basically was how we can train these weights parameters. We have two set of uh, parameters for the convolution layers, weights and biases. How we should train those parameters? So the idea is very simple, and that is great in this one using backprop theory. So how does it work? You just compute your error, error function, what, whatever your task is. If your task is regression, use, for example, a mean square error. If your task is classification, use crash entropy. And you use gradient descent to update your or adjust your parameters. And that's the idea. Very simple. OK, just, I just want to show you a very simple example. But in reality, you have hundreds or millions of the parameters. And your loss function is not, doesn't look like this. This is a very simple one, OK? So this is your error function with respect to your weight. So the idea of the gradient descent is that you want to tweak your weight a bit up and down to see how your error will change. And your objective is to find the minimum value. That's the idea of the <clears throat> gradient descent. So the first step, you change your weight a bit, and you compute a sloop of this error function or error, changing in error with respect to your changing your weight. In this case, if I change my weight by one, how much your error will change? The answer is minus two. So the S loop gonna be minus two divided by one, which is going to be minus two, right? So this minus two doesn't tell you where is the minimum, but gives you the direction where we should go or how we should change the weight to get the minimum value for the loss functions or loss. So imagine we have a very simple neural network, one output, one input, and one single hidden layer with one neuron. So you have this equation at the top for the first input times your weight, input weight, you get the intermediate value here, which is y. And you do the same for the second layer. Y times W2, you get the output. OK? So the idea is if we multiply these two values together, you get this. So this tells you if I change my weight here, how much does the error change? And this equals to changing the y over the first weight times changing the error or output function with respect to your intermediate value. So you can basically find a very simple solution, which is called chaining, chaining of the gradients to compute the error, changing the error with respect to your weight. So there is nothing to prevent us to repeat this process for all the layers with all the neurons. So very simple equations here, which is called chaining, meaning that if I change my weight, I want to figure out how the error will change is equal to, if I change my weight, how the A change, the first output. If I change A, how much B changes? And we just repeat this process, and this is called backpropagation because we need to start from the end to compute the error and just go back to the beginning. I just repeat this process, okay? And multiply this local gradient together to get, to, to get sense of how much you should change the weight to get the local minimum. So there is another thing, hyperparameter, which is called learning rate. So learning rate is very easy, basically telling you 
how much you should scale your gradient, okay? So this is the formula for updating your weights. So at each time, you compute the gradient, as I explained here, and you basically multiply by alpha, which is learning rate. So learning rate, it just basically adjusts the weight with respect to the last gradient. And just imagine if you have very high learning rate, what will happen is in the figure in the left side, you basically overshoot the minimum, which is not good, which is not what we want. But if your learning rate is too small, like the right figure here, you basically, step size will be very small and makes your training very slow, okay? So it's very important to write, to choose the right learning rate for your task. So, I just wanna give you some application of CNN. So before talking about some useful applications, uh, I just wanna mention the main part, which is basically the training strategies of your CNN. <coughs> Most of these famous CNN that you basically uh, see, like VGG, AlexNet, ResNet, whatever, they train on ImageNet dataset. And ImageNet dataset is the famous dataset. There are over a million of the images, basically. And also they have the challenge for image classification task. They release one over two, sorry, 1.2 million training images and 100K test images. And there are 1,000 categories of different objects, okay? And the good thing is that all of these famous CNN train on ImageNet can apply to other tasks. Very simple. So if you look at the history, in 2012, the AlexNet was the first CNN won this challenge here with eight layers and 61 million parameters. And that, that was kind of a stepping stone for, for CNN to be dominant in this field. So in 2015, ResNet, the famous ResNet, beat the human performance. And you see that by the time you, you will have much deeper layers here, this, the right figure basically shows the number of layers. You, must have, you, you, you have much deeper layers with much better accuracy for image classification task. So this slide is very important for you because this is the way you should train your CNN. If you ask me how many images do we need for a specific task, I will tell you it depends. I mean, it depends on difficulty of your task. Just imagine you want to classify cat versus dog, and you have another scenario. You want to classify the image taken in the day and image taken in the night. Which one is more difficult? Of course, the second one, exactly. So you need more samples and more images before deciding about the CNN type that you want to choose, okay? So there are many parameters you, you need to consider for, but just imagine you come up with a specific CNN, like VGG, and you want to train it. So there are different training and strategy. If you have massive data set with the labels, okay, you can train from scratch, but, most of the time you don't have efficient or sufficient samples and there is no way to train that, that deep CNN. So the idea is using transfer learning. We just rely on those nice CNN, powerful CNN with the weights trained on ImageNet, which I introduced earlier. And we want to take benefit of those CNNs for our specific task when we have limited number of the samples. So how does it work? We take the CNN, we freeze the layers of the feature extractor parts before classification head, okay? We freeze these layers, so the learning rate is gonna be zero. And then what we need to do, we just need to retrain the classification head of your CNN. You simply take away your softmax which in this case has 1,000 categories because it's trained on ImageNet. And ImageNet has 1,000 categories. And you change it to your number of your classes, and you just train it. 
but you freeze these layers. So these layers you can consider as a feature extractors and you can just simply use a linear classifier at the top for your specific task if you don't have sufficient samples, okay? But the third scenario is that when you have a little bit more data but not much, you can start to train more layers of your CNN, especially these feature extractor parts. So you can imagine you freeze these layers with learning rate of zero and you started to basically train some layers of feature extractors plus your classification heads. So here, the learning rate, you basically have three learning rates. So here, going to be zero because you freeze it. You just use it for extracting features. This part, you train it, but like one-tenth of your original learning rate, okay? A bit smaller. But these are initialized randomly, and you want to train with different learning rate, okay? So you have three different learning rate. Sorry, I just want to correct what I said. I, I said one third of, one ten of the original learning rate for the classification head, and you want to train this part with a smaller learning rate. Because you rely on those weights, but not much. You want to a bit change the weights, but not much as this one, okay? So you have three different learning rates. And in theory, you can use different techniques to train this CNN. For example, you can freeze these parts and just train this part, and then you go more layers into deep and start to train more layers, okay? Because if you started training of this part, the gradient will be huge, and you just basically can damage your other layers, okay? So you have three different learning rates. Zero, learning rate for this part, which should be bigger than the, this part, okay? Because you want to rely on those weights which you train on image nets, okay? So just briefly some use cases of CNN beyond classification. So you can use you can consider object detection or you can just convert this problem to classification task. And this is very a standard, very simple approach, and this is called a sliding window. The idea is very simple. You do a sliding window and you decide, based on your train scene and classifier, you decide that object of interest is inside of your window or not. It's very simple. So you do a sliding window for every patch you classify what objects, what objects that the patch does, does have. So you can use your train CNN, or basically it, it can be any features. But of course, if you use CNN features, it's gonna be more robust compared to those handcrafted features. So what's the problem with this approach? The problem with this approach is that the object comes with different skills, different aspect ratios, and if you use like a fixed size window, it doesn't work well. And you look for a way to improve the recall, to reduce the false negative. You don't want to miss anything, right? So the best solution is to use different size and different aspect ratio for your windows when you do a sliding window, okay? And increase the basic, decrease the sliding window, a stride size. I mean, how much you wanna shift your sliding window because you don't want to miss anything, okay? So by this way, you can improve the recall of your detection or it's better to say classification. So another problem is that once you do a sliding window, you get multiple positive response of your object of interest. For example, you see for this pedestrian detection the left side, you get multiple response, multiple candidates, and you need to choose one from all of these candidates. Basically reducing the false positive, right? So the technique that you can use is called non-maximum separation, and it's very easy. You consider all the candidates, and you, you pick the one with the maximum prediction scores, okay? For example, in this case, just imagine this bounding box is the prediction with maximum score. 
And for the rest of the bonding boxes, you basically see how much they overlap with your, this, the candidate bonding box. If the overlap is more than the threshold, you basically get rid of them because you don't need it. You just, at the end, you just need one candidate for your object. So this is the process. You basically pick the box with the highest confidence score and just remove all boxes where the intersection over union is more than threshold. Intersection of over union, if you don't know, is going to be intersection of two bonding boxes divided by the union, okay? It's very simple. So by this way, you can reduce the false positive and improve the precision, okay? So beyond classification, I quickly introduced two approaches and then we finish. So the CNN train on classification simply can apply to other tasks like segmentation, detection, depth estimation, and the reason is that whenever you train CNN for classification task, you basically learn uh, general information. Like for example, if you want to classify the dog uh, based on the breed, you basically learn geometry, you learn the pose information, you learn the parts of the, the dog, which can be useful for other tasks, okay? So just remember in the early days of uh, deep CNN, you extract some low level features which can be shared or will be similar for different types of uh, objects, different object categories. And one of the application of CNN is semantic segmentation. In this case, you assign to each pixel of your image the object category. So this why, this, this, this time you have the pixel classification. So the network I'm not going too much details, but the network is very simple, and the idea is you use this pre-trained CNN. You can imagine this encoder part as a pre-trained CNN, and you try to supplement this part with a decoder which to, to get back the original resolution of your input images. So in this decoder, we have some convolution uh, transpose layers, which I'm not going to talk about those stuff. But the idea is very, very simple. You have encoder, decoder. So the encoder will be similar to what you have used before, pre-trained CNN. And your decoder basically uh, try to recover the resolution of original image size. Another application is object detection. In a sliding window technique I mentioned, <coughs> you can convert detection to classification problem. But there are many sophisticated papers. They directly use CNN for object detection. But I'm not going to cover those stuff like fast RCNN, faster RCNN, YOLO. But this is like a base or one of the main references of object detection based CNN. And the idea is very simple. Instead of using broad force approach, you basically extract some region proposal on your image using different techniques like a sliding window approach, or sorry, using selective search approach, and you pass this region proposal to your CNN for the classification, instead of working with every pixel of your Im input images, which is much more efficient than a sliding window. Thank you. <laughs>